Um, in our next interview, we now have got Dr. Katharina Höfer. Um, she's currently starting um, her Max Planck Research Group, Bacterial Transcriptomics, at the Max Planck Institute for Terrestrial Microbiology in Marburg. And before she has been working at the Institute for Pharmacy and Molecular Biotechnology in Heidelberg, together with Professor Jeschke. And important for us, she has also been an advisor for the IGEM team Heidelberg 2015. And therefore we expect so many advices to <laughs> come here in the interview and let us seek the experience of an IGEM veteran. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much for the invitation uh, to have this interview and I'm looking forward to help you as much as possible with my experience with RNA biology and also as being part of the IGEM team 2015. <laughs> So, um, as I just said, it, you've been, uh, started working at your own group at the Max Planck Institute in Marburg in uh, April, I believe. And how is it getting started with your new lab in Corona times? And we're also going to be in the lab soon, so we hope so. Um, how do you have any hints to get started quickly in these times? Because we believe we don't have a lot of time in the lab left. Yes, so it's, um, I mean, Corona made everything difficult. Um, so when I, so it started to make everything difficult with our private moving because our uh, moving company just canceled uh, two days before we wanted to move. <laughs> so actually everything was a little bit difficult. Uh, so we get used to our own muscles and did the move on our own. And then we were in Marburg and more or less everything was closed. But the university was still open where I started. And uh, I was there from April to June till I started on the 1st of June at the Max Planck Institute. And there right now we still have Corona limitations. So we are working in shifts right now. And, uh, but this is working nicely. Um, so everyone has a different schedule. Everyone has a possibility to work. And uh, we have a little bit problems with uh, office spaces right now because just maximum of two can sit in one office. But nevertheless, <clears throat> somehow in one month, I was able to order everything that I needed. Everything was possible to order, which was amazing. This I was not expecting. This week, our new FPLC is already arriving. And also this week, the first student starts, uh, which is actually a former Mobi and the biochemist from Heidelberg. And uh, so I'm, I'm really, really happy that everything worked out that fast. Um, we, were, we were setting up the lab now. Two weeks ago, all my lab equipment from Heidelberg was also moving from Heidelberg to Marburg. There I was actually more afraid than I was for my private moving <laughs> because there were so many samples uh, that we need because I was working on the project already since two and a half years in Heidelberg at the lab from Professor Jeschke. And uh, I was damn happy and thankful that I was able to carry the whole project now from, Marburg, uh, from Heidelberg to Marburg. And now we can directly start. So actually, Corona is not that nice, but we are somehow able to manage it and even to work in the lab because um, the, the lab is also working in shifts and somehow it's interestingly working. And if there is just a day, we also have a night where it's probably a little bit more empty. <clears throat> okay, um, so you've already mentioned um, that you've been working as a postdoc together with Professor Jeschke and um, what you've been working on are cofactors and metabolites interconnected with um, RNA. Um, could you uh, well, just explain to the audience which effect uh, cofactors and metabolites on, uh, have on RNA and what exactly you were doing research on? Of course. <clears throat> so this is a long, long story that started actually in 2000 and let's say 12, when I was a uh, one year PhD student in Andras lab. And we were, uh, we had the idea that RNA is much more than four bases, just more than A, G, C and U. And we were actually 
three girls who started the fight against NAD RNA. So we had the idea that NAD might be part of the RNA. And so we developed a method that we called NAD Capture Seek. This is quite easy to explain. So you just put a handle to an NAD RNA in your test tube and you fish it out of the rest of the RNA and then you send it for next generation sequencing. And so we did this first time with E. coli because we thought E. coli is so well studied. We noticed afterwards it's not. <laughs> We identified so many different new RNAs. We, we I realized that plenty of RNAs are probably annotated. They have a name, but there's nothing known about them. Mm. So we really started from a scratch that was really, or is still basic research. We discovered like this NAD as a novel building block of an RNA that is always at the five prime terminus of an RNA. And it functions like a cap, so it protects our RNA from degradation, at least in E. coli. And we also discovered enzymes that are able to chop off the NAD specifically. We call it uh, NAPC. We did crystal structures. We started collaborations around the whole world just to characterize the NAD cap on its own. We saw how the R NAD RNA is generated in the cell. And this was a really amazing time because we were really kind of explorers. We had no idea what it would be good for. And yeah, we just had ideas. We tested them. This was really basic science. And uh, yeah, I'm looking really wonderful. This was such a wonderful time with uh, Hannah, Marie and me where we really started to discover something new in E. coli. But um, yeah. Uh, NAD RNAs are today known in all kingdoms of life. So the people from the US, for instance, they took our NAD capture seek, the fishing protocol, and they tested it on eukaryotic cell lines in yeast and plants, and it's everywhere present. So it doesn't look like that it's just specific for E. coli, it's really present everywhere. And um, <clears throat> based on this, I said, as I'm molecular biotechnologist by heart, I said, I actually want to know where it's good for. And this is what we are doing right now because the discovery of the decapping enzyme and also the biosynthesis is just a tip of the iceberg. Yeah, there is much more that we want to understand and we want to discover really the function of this novel NAD RNA modification. So I've read in one of your publications that um, <coughs> these coenzymes could also provide a layer of epitranscriptomic information. What exactly is meant with that? I mean, if you're just thinking about the uh, epitranscriptome, which is finally all modifications that could be part of an RNA. I think we know more than 40 years ago already that RNA has some specific methylations, for instance. Uh, this is also part of the epitranscriptome and these modifications, they change the stability, the processing, the translation and finally into proteins of this RNA. And they are regulating finally inside of the cell several processes. And we are pretty sure that also our NAD modification is part of this epitranscriptome. Those modifications that regulate cellular processes. Even what we already have identified that if we chop off the NAD cap yeah, by not C, where it's really removed, we are generating an RNA that is degraded much faster than the other ones. So already the degradation is a process of regulation in E. coli or in a cell. If you don't have a template for translation, your proteins are not generated. Yeah, it's quite simple. And uh, <clears throat> we also think, and we're pretty sure, that there are also proteins that can read, they can really see the NAD modification and they are able to bind specifically to the NAD RNAs. These are sometimes even enzymes that were not described to be or bind to NAD because usually NAD binding enzymes, they are so specific for NAD, they don't like NAD RNA at all. Yeah, they hate it actually because if you have such a long RNA stretch that's not fitting to your active site, yeah? So your enzyme can't eat the NAD RNA. So we, we are pretty sure that this modification changes uh, the 
function of specific RNAs in the cell, because not every RNA carries such a NAD modification. And we also see that the amount of NAD RNAs is different. There are several conditions where NAD RNAs are really increased at some level, they're really going down, but we haven't understood this yet. So this is really basic science. We can still be kind of an explorer yeah, to have an idea and to go into the lab and to test it, even if you have this idea in the morning under the shower. Yeah? So it's, it's such a pleasure for me and such a nice way to do research in a way to be kind of an explorer yeah, still in 2020. Um, thank you. So you've already mentioned that the NAD cap can bind, for example, to enzymes um, for to proteins. And as an iGEM team, we're also working on different protein RNA um, interactions in the cell and want to implement different um, applications. And we wondered whether it would be possible to use this NAD um, cap for RNA also um, to implement protein RNA interactions for true box, for example, in synthetic biology. Do you think there is a chance? There is a chance. Um, we, we identified now enzymes that are really able to take NAD as a substrate yeah, or as a, as a kind of, yeah, as a substrate in principle to really take it and to bind to it specifically. And even if you just take those enzymes and fuse it to something else that you want to have nearby, you can really trigger RNA protein interactions, for instance. You probably even just need the active site. You don't need the whole enzyme <clears throat> just to bring those two together. I think that's, that's really possible. Okay. And it um, would be also interesting then to, to really see how this behaves even in a cell. So, um, we also wondered, and I believe that's something um, you might also be working on, um, to see whether there are other cofactors uh, or cofactor modified and metabolite modified RNAs. Um, is there something um, you already can say about that? Yes, of course. <clears throat> so, I mean, NAD, just from a perspective of a chemist, as I'm kind of half chemist right now, because I was always working in chemistry labs <laughs> as a biotechnologist, uh, you are somehow becoming a chemist. Um, so if you have a, a few of a chemist to the NAD, you see there is a handle of a nucleotide. The adenosine is part of the chemical structure of NAD. And NAD is not the only coenzyme that carries such a nucleotide handle. So we have coenzyme A, we have FAD, for instance. There are plenty more that really carry such a or a nucleotide handle. And there are already <clears throat> publications out there from the American groups that were testing the polymerase from E. coli. If this polymerase, which is also generating the NAD RNA, if this enzyme also carries FAD or CoA as a substrate and incorporates it into the RNA, and it does. So we know in principle that in E. coli, but also in the eukaryotic kingdom, such RNAs that carry CoA or FAD could be generated. However, I mean, for NAD, we had this NAD capture seek to fish specifically those NAD kept RNAs. For FAD and CoA, we don't have it right now in our, our hands. Um, this kind of research is now uh, been done by Andres Jeschke in Heidelberg. So he's really now looking for different RNAs that carry probably different caps like CoA cap, FAD cap, whatever. And we are pretty sure that NAD is not the only one. So there are at least three or four more different caps out there. We are also now looking into the, the question if the NAD RNA can be also converted into something else. Just imagine that NAD is not only NAD in the cell. NAD could be also NADH, NADP, for instance. So it, we are looking now also if just the NAD RNA can be converted, for instance, to NADP or NADH RNA in E. coli. And if this changes then the function of this new capped RNA as well. 
So there, there's plenty of space for new research. And I think, especially in the field of five prime RNA modifications, we will discover plenty of different RNAs that carry different caps and have different functions in vivo. It's, that's very interesting, uh, but yet now from another perspective, how can you, how do you manage to synthesize NID RNAs in vitro and is there a method to uh, make them in vivo, so in bacteria, or will this method be available soon? Yes, so um, the, the way to do it in vitro is quite simple. So uh, we have done two ways right now. This is a classical in vitro transcription with a T7 RNA polymerase. So every molecular biologist who want to generate long RNAs in a test tube, they take T7 RNA polymerase. And by chance, this enzyme has also an active site that accepts NAD as a nucleotide. So if you decrease the ADP level, you can also put in NAD into your test tube, make your in vitro transcription, and you will generate, let's say, 50-50 NAD and 5 prime triphosphorylated RNA in the mixture. But sometimes <clears throat> you realize that in vitro transcriptions are a little bit tricky. Sometimes they have not such a good day, they are probably a little bit tired, you never know, so your in vitro transcription fails. And so we set up a method, this we published, I think in 2016, a bioconjugate paper, where we have kind of a biochemical reaction. So we, we generate monophosphorylated RNA, or you can even order it. And then we have a nicotinamide mononucleotide that carries the imidazole function. And this small chemical, um, we just put together with the RNA and then you have a nucleophilic attack of the RNA to the nicotinamide and there we generate in principle then an NAD molecule at the RNA in a covalent fashion and then we have NAD RNA. We, so this is in vitro. <clears throat> we can even make really pure NAD RNAs. Uh, we have a, yeah, kind of a, uh, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis system. Um, there you have a denaturing polyacrylamide gel. This is typical if you are doing RNA purification. But in this uh, gel, you put in an APB, it's called, it's aminophenylboronic acid. And this small molecule retards your NAD RNA in comparison to the triphosphorylated version. And then you can really cut it out, and then you have 100% pure NAD RNA but depends always what you need. In vivo, <clears throat> in vivo, we know that the E. coli RNA polymerase generates such NAD RNAs. But right now we cannot uh, distinguish why some RNAs are really highly modified and some of them are less modified. So you're not never getting 100% NAD RNA of the one RNA that you're looking for. Uh, the only thing that you can probably do is um, to, to take a RNA where you know that it's highly modified at this specific level. Or, I mean, if you're just thinking about the classical biochemistry, you have this BL21 DE3 cells. These DE3 cells carry a T7 RNA polymerase inside. So if you put an RNA that you want to have in front of a T7 RNA polymerase promoter, put this plasmid inside into your E. coli, you can easily generate, <clears throat> let's say, 30% of NAD kept RNAs in E. coli of this specific RNA. With the 7 RNA polymerase, you can really blast the uh, preparation of NAD RNAs because T7 is highly active. Did you ever purify your R an RNA from an E. coli with a T7 RNA polymerase inside? You will get um, a band that is just specific for your transcript or your protein final that, that you want to translate. Um, the classical 23, 16, and 5S are RNA, which are highly abundant. These are usually 90%. You don't observe on the gel. So you really have a blast of this RNA that is after your T7 RNA polymerase promoter. 
So this would be at least one way to have a higher concentration of this specific NAD RNA in E. coli, let's say. But you never get 100%. I mean, <clears throat> my lab, we are explorers, but when we are explorers, we also have to develop methods all day long. <laughs> because if you start something new, if you identify something new that never saw before, you are just developing methods, which I really like. And it's, it's always great to, to get, okay, how we can manage this situation. And we are getting better from year to year. I think once we also know how we can generate 100% NAD RNAs in E. coli, which would also provide for us a better way to really specifically characterize the function. That's, that's very promising. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, but what, what are the RNA post-transcription modification actually exist in bacteria? So the, the RNA modification, so the epitranscriptomics of E. coli, so in principle before we published the NAD cap, the general opinion or idea about RNA in E. coli was that we have 5 gram triphosphorylated, monophosphorylated and 5 gram OH RNA. There was one report about methylations of 6-methyl-A, uh, the classical methylation of internal RNA modifications uh, published by Chu and He already a long time ago, but there was never a follow up. And I think all these data were never really reproduced by different labs or somebody had a look on. So <clears throat> it's, um, it's hard to say if there's something else. Um, Right now, the people who are looking for methylations, for instance, they are changing all their protocols because those protocols were based on an, um, antibodies. And those antibodies, they're sometimes, depending which antibody you have from which company and when it was isolated and so on, they're so different. And uh, so you're sometimes getting a background where you probably think this is a real hit that is not a hit. So the, all of them, they're changing right now their protocols and they change from antibodies to chemical approaches, which I actually more like. <clears throat> but so right now, there is not so much known about modifications in bacteria itself. Um, this is also something which is quite sad for me because um, the eukaryotic world is well studied in this kind of epitranscriptomics, but in bacteria there is a lack, especially of to, to look for such things. Um, I mean, you also don't know if it's really not present. Could be also the case. Yeah, could be that the NAD, the five prime modifications, are the only one, and that we have methylations not present. Um, yeah, but we don't know. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the reason why we are so interested in different RNA modification is because we want to use um, RNA to form RNA DNA DNA triple helix, mm -hmm. and um, and we are concerned that uh, this RNAs will be unstable in cells. So could uh, NAD cap or some other modification help mm -hmm. to make this? Uh, so stabilize uh, the RNAs? Yes. Um, so, I mean, <clears throat> I was working so long time with RNA. Um, when we are looking for RNA stability, yeah, just without having modifications in our mind, we, we already see that the structure of our RNA changes the stability. Um, there is something that um, we call uh, a tRNA scaffold. This tRNA scaffold is something that you just attach to your RNA and it makes this RNA more stable. It looks like a tRNA. And as you know, there are plenty of tRNAs that we have and they're also quite stable in our cells. Just because of their structures, yeah, they form hairpins, which makes them not accessible to RNAs that actually usually degrade your RNA really fast. I was uh, once characterizing the half-life of specific RNAs. This is a classical old-fashioned rifampicin assay, 
where you just stop your RNA polymerase and then always isolate different fractions and put it on a northern blot. And then you see easily that your RNA is decreasing in its concentration. And some of them, they have a half-life of two minutes or 30 seconds, but some of them are not degraded after 20 minutes. And then you're wondering, okay, why is this one RNA more stable than the other one? And it's quite simple, it's the structure. So if you have, for instance, at the five prime terminus, a double-stranded hairpin, your RNA is getting more stable. And if you use this tRNA scaffold, you exactly have such structures. They make your RNA much more stable. So <clears throat> as I advise to increase, first of all, your stability of your RNA, put their kind of a hairpin at the five prime terminus. Even put an, a, this, this depends on the concentration that you want to have of your RNA in your E. coli. If you are not dependent on high, high, high concentrations, you can use, for instance, also an adenosine at the five, first nucleotide at the five prime terminus. Then to some extent, an NAD is, for instance, incorporated. This also would increase the half-life. On the other hand, <clears throat> if you are really dependent on really high concentrations, then you would probably make use of a T7 polymerase system. But T7 RNA polymerase works best if you have G as an initiator nucleotide. Even three Gs are much better. And like this, you can really increase the amount of your RNA in your E. coli. But this also always depends how much you want to have. If you have a normal cellular transcription, then adenosine that in increases the chances that the NAD gets incorporated is probably nice and the structure. The structure is really important. If you have a five prime single stranded end, this gets rapidly degraded because an RNA really can see this and it just chops it off and degrades it till the end. At the three prime end, you can do the same because there are also RNAs that also attack the three prime end. Yeah, thank you. That, that helps a lot. <laughs> um, we, we got interested in your work called uh, Universal Optimal Based Real Time Monitoring of Enzymatic RNA Synthesis. Our Could Swedish you... part. <laughs> <laughs> Could you explain what the system is about and um, which, which hurdles would we, should we think about if we would try to implement a similar system in our work? Mm -hmm. um, so this was something that I developed in my first year of my PhD. Um, this is also something to the students out there. If you have an idea in the morning, under a shower, just go to the lab and test it. Don't tell it to your boss, just test it. If it works, go to your boss and say, I have there something that is probably actually quite nice. <laughs> it was the story of my spinach tart. Um, the spinach tart is quite simple. So the in 2011 or 12, I think Sammy Jeffrey's lab, they um, did a Zelex. So this is an in vitro generation of aptamers. So kind of an evolution in a test tube. And they identified the spinach as a RNA that interacts with a small molecule. And by this interaction, a fluorescent signal is emitted, yeah, if you put a specific light on it. And uh, this spinach aptamere, I just had in my hands at the beginning of my PhD. And then I came up with the idea that in principle, when we transcribe this RNA in a test tube, we are increasing all the time the concentration. And if we put this small molecule on it and shine light on it, we should see also an increase in the fluorescence of this. And this reminded me on a classical real-time PCR, where you're also generating much more DNA after each cycle. And if you use cyber, goal, uh, cyber green, you're also increasing the fluorescent signal, which correlates finally to your DNA signal. Here we had the same, we're increasing the, uh, the amount of RNA during the transcription. And we also increase by this RNA aptamere spinach, the fluorescence over the time in the same ratio. 
And so I went to the lab and used <coughs> classical T7 in vitro transcription as I described it before. And uh, my student at this time, also a, a Mobi from Heidelberg, I told her just pipe it together, put it into the fluorometer and we will see what's going to happen. So after 10 minutes, we already see clearly increase of the fluorescent signal and we knew, okay, something is working. Um, after half an hour, we saw such a signal. It was uh, quite sad. And then I came up, ah, uh, yeah, that's so simple. That's the power phosphate that gets formed and it forms a salt with magnesium together and precipitates. Therefore, our detector was not able to detect anything except this precipitate. So we made use of a pyrophosphatase. So this is really important for your assay design. You have to put a pyrophosphatase into your in vitro transcription. This directly removes the pyrophosphate Therefore, no precipitate occurs and you can nicely see an increase of the fluorescent signal over time. Um, we even improved this whole spinach system. So we put the spinach in front or behind a hammerhead ribozyme. A hammerhead is a ribozyme that can cleave itself, for instance, in the middle or can specifically cleave the RNA when it's present. And like this, we were able to uh, have an RNA of interest in front that we want to transcribe. Then we have a hammerhead and after the hammerhead our spinach optomere. And like this we were even able to quantify the transcription of different RNAs at the same time because we were always quantifying the same fluorescent signal. Yeah, and we <clears throat> just called it spinach tart, which is in principle a real-time transcription in comparison to a real-time PCR. It's just such a simple idea and it works in every hand, <laughs> which is uh, even much better because I was doing this with plenty of different students. Uh, even the company started to collaborate with us because they needed also a lot of RNA and this system was able to really monitor your transcription really fast and to optimize your transcription really fast. Usually when you optimize your transcription, you take the in vitro transcription, put it on a gel, let the gel run for three hours and then you see, okay, it was not working. With our system, you can compare at the same time in one hour, 384 different conditions. That was amazing. When I joined Heidelberg 2015 iGEM team, uh, we also used the spinach system. Uh, this was also one reason why I joined them as a supervisor. Um, Together with the iGEM team, we had the idea to use the spinach as a sensor um, for ATP in that case. We just combined the spinach with a, an app, uh, an <coughs> with the ATP RNA sensing yeah, RNA in principle. So there were different developed also from Zelex, for instance, and we just fused them together. And when the right structure was folded by the interaction with the ATP, we should see increase of the fluorescent signal. This actually worked quite nice in vitro, um, but we were still struggling a little bit in vivo, but that's normal. And this is also something that should be like this. <laughs> Otherwise science would be so easy. <laughs> Um, so what, what is your idea to use the spinach system or to, to use a fluorescent aptamere? So we had an idea to also make a sensor, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's more on. So our main main idea of the project is uh, use RNAs, fun different functional RNAs in different ways, but um, we also need an. Um, so some target what what do we how do we want to sell our project basically mm -hmm. and that's that's could be a, selling, a sensor could be a selling point of course <clears throat> so i mean the spinach is now quite old yeah so it's already kind of a grandma uh, because since 2012 uh, plenty of different aptamers were discovered and developed so that we have now also the mango aptamere, for instance, which is really, really nice and highly sensitive. Um, 
Also, uh, the Jeschke group in Heidelberg, they, they did a lot of aptomeres, for instance, the Zira aptomere, um, they, or the Rhodamine aptomere, so they, they did really a lot of different uh, aptomeres that are able to, that are first of all really small, that you can easily fuse it, but they also have a really nice fluorescent signal. Also, Sammy Jeffrey developed the broccoli, yeah, so he has his vegetable uh, aptomeres, um, they are also getting better and better and better. To have it working as a sensor, I think, is still a really nice idea. Um, I would be really happy, for instance, to have such a sensor for an NAD RNA. Yeah? Uh, that would be really cool. <laughs> so we, we never looked into this. Um, and I also don't know anyone who's looking for this right now. Um, to, to have a sensor where you can say, okay, this amount of NAD RNA we have in a test tube or we, we have, for instance, in vivo, if it's possible. But um, that's probably really tricky to, to develop something like this. Um, interesting sensors um, are, of course, always for small metabolites. Um, one advice that I can give to you is to to think about really what is the actual concentration of my metabolite that I will, was, want to look for in vivo. So if the concentration is too less, it might be difficult. Or which conditions can I use to increase the concentration of my metabolite? Because otherwise you're probably running into the small problem that your limit of detection is too high and you can't detect it in vivo. I mean, anyway, in vivo, you, you have so many different problems. Also, your folding of your RNA is sometimes a little bit different than in your test tube. Um, but there's the only way, test it. <laughs> um, and I always try to, to, to go the way from in vitro to in vivo. So I always tested it before in a test tube to see if it's working, first of all, and if I get reliable results. And I also was using different fluorometers. So I was using fluorometers like a TCAN that can do really 96 well for MITs. But I was also using fluorometers that are highly sensitive, even to, to see if there is a signal, but it's really low. But there you can always just one put one cuvette inside. And yeah, that takes a lot of time to test it in comparison to a TCAN where you really have a huge format. I mean, for iGEM 2015, we were able to set up the system then in a TCAN format, which was really nice in a way where we could really also check for different ATP concentrations at this time. Thank you. Um, so an another idea we have uh, is to use RNA as linkers between proteins instead of peptide linkers. Um, so, and maybe also, for example, use RNAs that will change uh, the structure depending on, on like, like aptomers, mm -hmm. binding proteins in that way, they could, uh, for example, stop binding these two proteins together, this linker, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, so, are there any rational methods to design the link in such a way that this, um, that it has stable structure on itself, and, but when it binds a specific molecule, the structure is changed. Mm -hmm. So I, I really like the idea. First question is how you want to connect your proteins to the RNA because it has to be covalent or? No, no, we, we thought of using RNA binding proteins. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, first of all, so this is something that um, is quite interesting. So if you have 100 nucleotide long RNA, this has actually a size of 30 kilodalton. So our RNA is actually from its molecular size, a really huge molecule. Yeah, just 100 nucleotides is nothing. Um, there are plenty of different um, modeling tools online available for RNA where you can really have a look 
for the RNA structure itself. This is just always a prediction and the prediction gets worse the longer your RNA is, for sure. Um, <clears throat> but this will at least give you an idea about the structure of your RNA. Um, especially for, let's say, ribozymes or something like this that you can, or even ribo switches that you can put in between, for instance, where you put a small molecule inside your E. coli, then it falls a structure. Um, I'm pretty sure that you can change also the lengths, yeah, because the structure is formed and it's getting closer. The structure is not formed, it's getting longer. There you can just play a little bit around and have a look <clears throat> how these ribo switches changes probably even just the the specific length of your RNA and then everything gets closer or it's getting more uh, on the other sides. That might be something really interesting to look for. Um, how you want to measure if those proteins come together? Oh, sense. Yeah, Fred in principle or? Um, well, probably something like um, Fred or something. Mm. Um, or split GFP. Hmm. Yeah, something like this. Yeah, split GFP might be really interesting. I mean, you just have to, to check if even if your RNA binding proteins are present, if this split GFP can form or not. But this you can do in your test tube. Yeah, anyway. Um, but idea I, I really like. So this is something that's, uh, that's really cool. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, I would probably go for ribo switches. I mean, um, there is a lot of work from Sammy Jeffries' lab and also some other groups who did, uh, let's say, sensors of the spinach aptomere. And they are really nicely described and there's also usually a structure given how they are formed. So you don't have to invent everything from a scratch. Uh, because to just generate a sensor uh, based on a rational design will take you a lot of time. I think here, uh, especially in Corona times where lab times are a little bit restricted, <laughs> forbidden, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> not possible. Um, it's good to have a look into the literature and to see what the people already did. And um, there are plenty of ribo switches that were fused to such things. And I'm pretty sure that they are changing their RNA length. And if you then, for instance, see, okay, the length of my RNA is not long enough, then you just put on the five prime or the three prime end kind of a, a RNA that doesn't form that much structures. Then you can increase the size a little bit. And then you just have to find and play a little bit what is the right length of my compound. But I think this will work. I mean, you just need to play a little bit, have a look into the literature. For the SAM ribo switch, they, they have really done a lot. <clears throat> and um, probably even, uh, that would be probably even more cooler. Um, if you have kind of a spinach aptomere or even a mango aptomere inside, you can put them also in rows. Yeah, so you can put five mango aptomeres behind each other. And if they are binding to the small molecule, they are coming then probably more closer together. And you, at the same time, when the small molecule binds to your RNA, you're even getting a signal, a fluorescent signal that you can measure. So you know at least you have a readout that your molecule interacts with your RNA. So you have such, in principle, two re readouts. You have the one readout where you know, okay, my molecule is binding to the RNA. It gets more dense. And the second readout, for example, is the split GFP. Yeah. Then you have two ways also of control. I mean, if you just get a signal because you add the small molecule, then you know, hmm, okay, something else happened, but my RNA was somehow not changing in its space. And like this, you have two readouts. As a referee, I would be really happy with this. Okay. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. And uh, as a last question, uh, are there any, do you have any tips uh, when generally planning experiments and working with such uh, functional RNA, what, what should we keep in mind? 
Um, so general tip is, uh, if you work with RNA, avoid RNAs. <laughs> Put there a lot of gloves inside the lab. Uh, we always use 30% H2O2 to just decontaminate, decontaminate the pipettes. But in principle, I never, in my whole life, I never had huge RNA problems. So don't be so much afraid. This is the second tip. <laughs> Uh, the third tip is plan controls. So always think about the control first before you plan your experiment. Um, this is some advice that I also got when I was principal bachelor student. Uh, when my advisor told me, okay, <clears throat> do you have a proper control for your experiment? I said, mm, I'm not really sure. Then you should not do this experiment. First do the controls and then you should go for the rest. Uh, especially in terms of RNA, um, to have a control that in principle everything was working in that way you wanted to do it is really important. Look into the literature. Yeah, Look what people already did and if you can make use of this. Um, there, right now, especially in the field of aptomers, there are a lot of things that are published, that were known, that were nice described even by crystal structures. And the fifth advice and the last advice, um, do it with passion um, and don't hesitate to contact me if you need any DRNAs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I believe that was a really um, valuable interview for us with tips concerning RNA linkers and a DRNA. I think we can use a lot of this. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to help even just by email. And if I'm once in Heidelberg, it's just kind of my second home um, as I was so long there. Uh, I can also come by. Sure, we will definitely <laughs> just uh, write us an email. You can just um, visit our lab also. <laughs> I hope the lab exists <laughs> then. <laughs> and we don't have a second lockdown. <laughs> okay, thank you a lot. Thank you.